So I'm pleased to welcome Craig McAdam, who's the conservation director at Bug Life, for his actually second Ento Live. Uh, but this time he's going to be talking about something quite similar to the species group that I study, it's a fellow worm, and we'll be talking about leeches, their life history and identification. So, Craig, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. Um, it's great to see so many people here to hear about leeches. And as Kieran says, I'm Craig McAdam, I'm Conservation Director at Bug Life. And for those of you that don't know about Bug Life, um, Bug Life is the Bug Life's the only organisation in Europe concerned with the conservation of all invertebrates. We cover everything from spiders to starfish, uh, mayflies to millipedes, anything, any invertebrates. And our aim is to halt invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates in the UK and wider afield. We do this through a number of different uh, ways. We go out and we inspire people, we take people out and we show people invertebrates. We, we get them up close and personal with them in their habitats. We undertake practical conservation work like this uh, in the top right, the, the um, uh, bog, bog restoration work that we were doing in central Scotland at that time. We also try and shape policy and decision makers' minds and try and get them to understand how important invertebrates are. So we do a lot of advocacy. And then we do raising awareness um, and outreach and engagement, um, something like this that we're doing today. And um, where we we tell people all about invertebrates and how important they are and, and how we can help them. So today I'm going to talk to you about leeches. And as um, Kieran said, they're uh, related to earthworms. So what is a leech? Um, well, they're segmented worms. Um, so they're in the phylum Annelida, which is the segmented worms. And then they're in the sub, in the in the class Clitella, Clitellata, sorry. Um, which means with a clitellum, um, which we'll come on to in a second. The uh, that clitellata is um, split into three different um, subclasses. Um, we've got the oligochaeta, which are the earthworms and relatives. We've got the branchiobdelids, which are actually leeches, but they're only found on crayfishes. Um, and the in the UK we have three species. One that is on the native crayfish, um, the white clawed crayfish, and two that have been found fairly recently on non-native um, North American signal crayfish. Um, and then finally, we've got the the true leeches, the hyridinia, um, which we'll be covering today. In the UK, we have five families uh, split into two uh, um, orders, uh, the Rinco, Rincobdelida, which are uh, leeches with a retractable proboscis, so they feed with a proboscis rather than with jaws, and then a rincodelida, which don't have a pro proboscis and usually feed with a, a set of jaws. Um, there's the numbers of species. So we've got a very small fauna in the UK. We've got 17 species in total, um, which is relatively poor compared to the rest of Europe. Um, Interested, just one point to point out with the Piscicolidae, the first uh, family there, we've got two species of freshwater Piscicolidae, but there's 26 uh, marine species that are found around the UK shores and the UK waters. And then in Europe, um, the, the figures in, in red there are the freshwater leeches across Europe. So you can see there's a, a high diversity in the Piscicolidae um, and the Glossophonidae and Erperbidelidae, and the others are, are relatively small. And in mainland Europe, there's a, another family that is, is found there, Z, the Zerabdelidae. Um, we don't have any of those species in the UK. So um, I mentioned that earthworms and leeches are related, so how do we tell them apart? So let's have a quick look at some of the features of, of earthworms. Um, so earthworms have got a segmented body, as do leeches. Um, but earthworms never have eyes. They don't have eyes um, as we would uh, see in leeches. They don't have any suckers either. So they um, they move in a different way to leeches, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, they typically have setae on their their bodies, which is what uh, which are used in the movement. And they've got a clitellum, which is the saddle um, that people will understand from earthworms. Leeches. In contrast, have a sucker on either end of the body. The, the rear sucker, the, the, at the tail end, if you like, is the is the bigger sucker, more obvious one. 
and the uh, one at the head end is either within the mouth or or forms part of the, the, the head and is not as obvious. They have anything from two to 10 eyes um, and the positioning of those eyes is really important in identification. We'll go into that in a little bit of details. And they also have um, the same segmentation. We'll see in a second that they do have a clitellum, um, but it's not obvious as, as obvious as in earthworms. Also with um, leeches, they often have um, annulation and, and papillae, so raised bumps on their, on their body, which are also useful for identification. So I mentioned that they move in different ways. Um, these are just two sort of diagrams and a couple of um, movie clips to show you movement. So in the earthworms on the left, they're contracting and, uh, and uh, expanding the body and creating friction um, on, the, on the surface that they're moving on to pull the body along. So they've got a, a gliding sort of motion um, along the body. They never bunch up and, and uh, go into a loop. In contrast, the leeches on the right have, uh, they use their suckers to get purchase on the, on the substrate. They'll put the front, they'll reach out uh, their body and stick the front, their, their head sucker onto the surface. Then they'll let go of the uh, rear sucker and bring that up right next to the head one. And then they'll be able to move in a stepwise fashion from there. Very distinctive in in a tray or a, a, a pot or whatever when you, you've, you've collected them. Um, the other thing with uh, leeches is that they will also swim. And we'll see a picture, we'll see a video of a swimming leech in a minute. Um, just some close-ups on some of the other features. So uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the the uh, suckers on this horse leech. You can see the large um, posterior sucker, the one at the back end of the leech is the one, the lower one, the circular one. And in the and above that, you can see the, the head sucker. And that's incorporated within the mouth, around the mouth. Um, and you can see there, it's, it's stuck onto the glass of this aquarium that it's been filmed, it's been photographed in. On the left-hand side, um, two other features that are important in the ID are the genital pores. So leeches are hermaphrodite, and they have both male and, and female uh, reproductive systems. And you can see here the positioning of these pores. The, the, the male pore is, is typically like a small hole, um, whereas the, the female pore is a slit. And in this particular photograph, you can see the copulatory tube that comes out of the the male um, genital pore, and then is uh, inserted into the, the female of another leech. You can see here the, the slight expansion of the of the body just below the, the head there, which is the clitellum that I said that wasn't all that obvious in, in leeches. Um, it becomes more obvious, and, and that swelling sort of occurs more when, there's, uh, when they're ready to breed, um, when they're ready to... Uh, to um, reproduce and find a mate. So that, that swelling will occur. And we'll see later on a, a bit more about their, their breeding habits. And just, just to show that in a bit more detail, this is Trochita subviridis, one of the larger uh, leeches in the air prob probdelidae. And you can see quite clearly there the clitellum on that, mimicking um, quite quite well the uh, uh, clitellum of, a, of, a, of an earthworm. I mentioned annulation and papillae. Um, so annulation is, uh, so in, in, in earthworms, they can have sometimes over a hundred segments in their body. Whereas in leeches, they always only have 34 segments. But those segments can be subdivided by these annu this annulation, which is a, a shallow groove in the, in the um, body surface. And you see here just some diagrams of this annulation. You see how it, it differs by different species. So in the um, ones marked D and E there, you can see that there's some segments, um, some, of the, some of the annuli are subdivided again, so we get very narrow um, uh, annuli on the, the body. And the pattern of that annulation is, is particularly important. The other point that is important is to look at the uh, number of annuli between the two pores because that comes up in the key as well. The little 
bars at the side of these diagrams is the actual segment. So you can see, for instance, in the um, in uh, diagram A there, it's got five annuli per, per segment. And in the bottom ones, the bottom diagrams there, that this is um, a trachea species, diagrams of a trachea species. And you can see again, that's the segment there, the, the five separate um, annuli within the segment. And as the leech grows, the annulation in this particular species changes as it grows. And you can see that the, the annuli progressively get more and more subdivided as, as, it, as it gets bigger, going left to right. The other part here is the papillae. So papillae are, are, could be best described as, as small warty bumps on the surface of the leech. Um, they are typically on the middle annula of the um, segment. So you can see here in the same, same fashion as before, the little bar at the side shows the segment. There's three annuli in this, in this segment and the papillae are on the middle one mostly. Um, the sum on other ones. And in the little figure to the right there, you can see the raised bumps on that uh, leech. Uh, also within these sort of like bumps and things, in the in the fish leeches, the Piscicolidae, they have something that looks like an annula, uh, sort of like a, a papillae, um, but it's actually what's called a vesicle, and that's a fluid-filled um, uh, sac at the side of the the body, and these the, you can see them here. They're usually on, um, again on on maybe on the last um, segment of the uh, the last annuli of the segment, and these pulsate in life, so they, they'll they'll go in and out, and they can be useful in separating the two species of uh, piscicole that we've got in in the UK. Um, they're more obvious in piscicole polar sedali than they are in geometra. Now the main thing with uh, leech ID is to look at the eyes um, and the pattern of the eyes can tell you what family it is and, and often down to what species it is as well. Um, so here are some of the, the, uh, the common patterns of eyes in the species. In the Piscicolidae they can have two to four eyes, usually um, at the at the body end of the head sucker, and the sucker is particularly big, as you can see in that diagram in the top left. And um, that the expansion is the is the sucker, and uh, the eyes are at the towards the body end of the sucker. Um, they also have a celly on their uh, rear sucker, and um, so they can really see out their backside. Um, the Arpobdelidae have. Um, Two pairs of eyes, uh, yes, two pairs of eyes, and um, two towards the front, and then two further down the the body. Um, these are a little bit more difficult to see than the ones in the Piscicolidae, um, but they are obvious uh, if you can get a a, a a light on them, and and potentially I'll, another way of of looking at eyes is just to put them to get the leech to go through between two. Um, surfaces, so so it spreads itself out and makes itself thinner, and you'll be able to see the eyes a lot clearer. Um, the Harudidae and the Haemopidae, so that's the medicinal leech and the horse leech, um, the eyes are really difficult to see. Um, you've really got to uh, focus in on the side of the, the animal, um, because the eyes are, are down the, sort of like, towards the, the edges of the of the head. The Glossophonia are a lot easier to see. A lot of these species are fairly light backgrounds, as we'll see as we go through some images later on. Um, and the patterns of eyes are, are, are useful for identifying them. A particular patterns is that there are uh, uh, two or three species that only have two eyes. Uh, there's a Placobdella costata and Helobdella stagnalis. Um, Hemiclepsis has a, a an extended sort of like drawn out head, um, which isn't just the sucker like the Piscicolidae. It's actually the head itself, and and it has four eyes. And Theramizin, which is the duck leech, has these eight eyes in parallel, slightly diverging lines down the head. 
the glossophonia have a, a variety of different eye patterns and they can sometimes be uh, combined and and um, slightly distorted uh, depending on how it's developed and, and so on. Typically, there are six eyes um, or four eyes, um, but sometimes they can combine and you can end up with two or one or an odd shape on one side. Um, it's usually possible to work out from the positioning of the eyes how many it should have. So to summarize uh, the differences between earthworms and leeches, um, so the body segmentation, there's 34 segments in a leech, and um, they can be split into shallow sort of annuli, um, but uh, never more than 34 segments, whereas in earthworms, there are numerous segments up to up to 100 segments. There's annulation present on the leeches, but there's never annulation on the earthworms. The clitellum on the earthworm is, is always obvious, um, whereas in the leeches, it's it's only obvious in the breeding season. Um, one thing I didn't mention there was the, the gut. The gut morphology is different. So in, in earthworms, the gut is a continuous tube, whereas in the leeches, it's a branched um, structure. And you can see that in this uh, this image of Albuglossophonia heterocleta, where, where you can see the food is actually filling out the the different um, diverticula, the diverticuli of the of the gut. Um, suckers, no suckers in earthworms, but suckers present at both ends of the leeches. Um, setae present in the earthworms, but not present on the leeches. So these are the little hairs. Um, both are hermaphrodites. Um, the earthworms move by expansion and contraction, while the leeches move by looping or swimming. And the diet of earthworms is typically organic matter, whereas leeches will feed on animal matter. The diet of leeches uh, is quite well studied. There's been quite a lot of work on uh, looking at what, what they're preying upon, um, but we are still learning a lot more about leeches all the time. And you can split it generally into two different groups, those that are sanguivorous on other animals, so things that are feeding on the blood or hemolymph of other invertebrates uh, and other animals, and those that are macrophagous, the ones that are eat eating the whole thing um, whole or, or in, in parts. The fish leeches, uh, Piscicola, are all, uh, all, all found on fish, typically on trout or, or roach or, or other um, coarse fish that are in the, in the water body. Um, they'll feed um, anywhere on the body, but sometimes they'll be found just, um, I find them typically just underneath the, 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 the mouth, the jaw of the, the mouth on the underside of the head. The Glossophonidae have a wide variety of different preferences. Most of them are feeding on snails um, and other mollusks. Um, they will feed on other aquatic insects, uh, so mayflies and, and midge larvae and the like. Um, and and on worms, and then there's a few of them that will actually feed from um, tadpoles or amphibians, um, adult amphibians. So we've got Glossophonia pallidosa, which has been known to feed on tadpoles, um, Hemiclepsis marginata and Placobdella costata, which uh, feed on um, adult and juvenile um Amphibians, hemiclepsis is more the, the juveniles, placobdella is, is more the, the adults. And then finally, we have um, the ones that feed on birds. We've got placobdella castata, uh, which will feed on waterfowl, and theramycin tessulatum, which is the duck leech, and it feeds by inserting itself in the duck's nostril, and it will feed actually in the nostril cavity um, directly on the, the duck's blood. And then the, the only one left to mention there uh, in the sanguivorous species is the medicinal leech, which I'll talk about a lot more later on. And it feeds on blood from a wide range of animals, including humans and other mammals. Of the macrophagous species, uh, mostly the big leeches that are, are feeding directly um, on whole animals. So we've got the horse leech, which will feed on a wide range of different species. Uh, there, if anybody saw 
the I think it was Spring Watch um, with the horse fleets taking a, a tadpole. Um, they'll they'll see how effective a predator uh, they can be, and then the uh, Airpod Delidae will feed on a wide range of species. A lot of them prefer um, snails and and worms, but they will feed on a, a wide range of animals. And all those those species, the macrophage species, will also feed on um, dead or moribund animals. So so they'll they'll do a bit of uh, scavenging as well. Just some examples there. So in the top left is a fish leech attached to a trout. Uh, the the large sucker at the on the right hand of the picture is the rear sucker. The head sucker is on the left, and it'll be feeding through the skin of that trout onto the blood. Um, of the fish. Bottom left is uh, Glossophonia, Glossophonia um, complanata, very washed out one, um, which is feeding in a snail shell there. So it's it's got its head right in there and is feeding on the, the snail body. And then on the right hand side is a dead toad that is being fed upon by a couple of uh, horse leeches. Uh, reproduction is uh, uh, quite unusual in leeches. So um, they, like I said, they're hermaphrodite. They'll, they'll um, share sperm between them, uh, between uh, two individuals, and then they'll um, it, in in the larger leeches they'll produce a a foamy um, substance, which they then extrude out of their their the the, the pores into onto the ground, and then within that. Home, they'll put some eggs um, anywhere uh, between 12 to 16 eggs um, for the, the larger, the medicinal leech. Um, and they'll the, the, the foam will then harden over those eggs and it makes this sort of like little expanded foam parcel to protect them in. And they'll put these under, they'll, they'll lay these under stones and things on the shore of the, of the lake or the pond. Um, they can lay an, an adult uh, medicinal leech can lay anything between one to eight cocoons, each with twelve to sixteen eggs. So fairly effective um, reproductive strategy. On the right hand side of this image are some Erpobdelidae cocoons. Um, so these are slightly different. They they extrude this material that then hardens into these little capsules, and within there there can be anything up to uh, ten to twelve eggs. And they'll lay anything between one to seventeen cocoons, often on a piece of rock or other substrate. And they'll use their rear sucker to actually scrape the um, to, to clean off some of the algae and stuff before they actually lay their their cocoons. Uh, the Glossophonidae take a completely different approach to uh, to egg laying in that they actually hold their eggs within their uh, the the cup their body and hold the eggs within the, the body cavity below the body. And this picture of the duck leech actually shows loads of tiny um, leeches that have hatched out of the eggs and is, are being carried on the underside of the leech. So they really are, you know, they're, they're brooding them, they're, they're, uh, they're keeping them and, and rearing them um, as they go along. So uh, we'll go through some of the species that are found in the UK. And we'll um, then go on and talk a little bit more about uh, the medicinal leech. So the first species is Albaglossophonia heterocleta, which is a, a pale coloured species. And we can see the, the gut through this one quite clearly. And you can also see that the muscular sort of like uh, lines within the, the body. It can have, it used, typically has six eyes, um, but it often has mutations in those eyes and combinations. You can see this particular one um, on the right-hand side of the image, you can see that some of the eyes have, have fused together. And um, so it looks a bit like it's got maybe five eyes there. Glossophonia complanata, another one of the Glossophonidae, um, uh, typically has six eyes like this particular specimen has, and it has these markings on it. You can see the papillae and um, the white dots were there where the papillae are present, but also the, the black and white patterning down the body as well. Quite a pretty leech in, in real life um, can have a bit of variation in its colouring as well. 
Glossophonia vericata is very similar, except the papillae um, don't form lines across the leech. They form sort of like W shapes. So there's a, one of the papillae is is lower than the other two on the on the side of the leech. But you can see again, it's got this um, mottled, mottled sort of uh, uh, patterning where the uh, lines and, and various greens and, and creams um, are produced. This is a this is a preserved specimen, so it doesn't really show off the color all that well. But this is Glossophonia pallidiosa, um, which is again a similar similar to the other two. Um, but we can see here that the, the preservation has lost all the color, so we are, we can't see the the color patterns that it has. Um, it typically has four eyes, but can sometimes reduce down to just the one. Uh, the duck leech, we've talked about the duck leech a bit already. This is the duck leech um, theramycin tessulatum. Um, what we can see is uh, it's got pretty much got two different forms. So when it's brooding eggs, it goes into this gelatin, gelatinous sort of like green or amber shaded uh, mass. And you can see the two images on the left-hand side of this, this slide have uh, are, are of a brooding um, duck leech. You see the eggs actually just at the side of the one on the, the bottom left of the uh, image. Um, when they're typically in life, they're, they're a brighter green colour um, and, and more muscular, um, more uh, a firmer constitu constitution than, than the, when they're brooding eggs. And you can see that they've got this distinctive eye patterning where there's eight eyes which slightly diverge from each other. Very distinctive in, in real life. Hemiclepsis marginata has got a distinctive shape. It's got these ex the, the expanded head, which you can see on the right-hand side of this image here. Um, it's got a fairly large um, rear sucker as well, and typically got a, a, some lines running down the back, which are interrupted by the, the papillae. You can just about see the papillae on this image here as well. Uh, usually with four eyes, um, sometimes they can merge into two very long eyes on either side of the, the, the head. Helobdalus thignalis um, is a really very common leech um, and is a fairly nondescript colour-wise. It goes from a, a brownish, an off-brown colour to a greyish colour. The, the key identification points are that it always only has two eyes. And then if you can just see on the image here, you can just see the little brown speck below, the, uh, just back from the eyes. That's a little callosity, a little, um, what's called a scoot. And um, it's a little hard piece of, um, of of material, which is present on the, the back of these leeches. No idea why it, it's there or what purpose it has, but it's a fantastic ID. Um, feature you you can tell the species straight away from that that um, the presence of that scoot. And the final glossophonid is Pacobdella cassata, um, which again only has two eyes. It's got a very tapered uh, body, so it, it looks um, you know very pointed towards the the front end. The um, rear sucker is relatively small compared to the the body width at that that point. Um, but the main point in this is it's it's really warty. The, the papillae are really prominent, and it looks like it's just covered in in uh, bumps all over it. Um, it's a very pretty leech. This one is fed recently, so you can see a, a reddish tinge to the um, the gut inside. But uh, but yeah, it, it's got a, a pretty pattern on it. Moving on to the Arpobdelidae. Um, again, nicely patterned individuals, these two here. Uh, this is our Erpobdella toculata. It is a fairly large leech. Um, the patterning is, the eye pattern is this, is typical of the Erpobdellidae with the two pairs at the front of the head and two um, slightly back. Um, Erpobdella always has this black patterning. Um, even in, in preserved specimens, you can see the black patterning uh, uh, on the on the um, dorsal surface, the um, I get a lot of records through on iRecord of 
uh, horse leeches and people thinking that it's Arpobdella octoculata. Horse leeches tend to be completely black with with none of this yellow the yellow speckling that we can see here. Um, but I'll show you a horse leech in a second and you can you can compare it yourself. The other Arpobdella we've got in the UK um, couldn't be any more different than uh, octoculata. It's Testacea, which has no black patterning. It's got this reddish brown sort of colour. It's quite a delicate looking leech compared to um, octoculata, which is quite a, a, a substantial leech. Um, this is found in ponds and in in watercourses across the UK, but fa fairly rarely um, recorded. I think people just don't see it as a leech or, or perhaps think it's a flatworm or something. We have two um, species of trachyta in the UK, and trachyta are unusual in that they are probably as close as we get in the UK to being terrestrial leeches, so land leeches. They um, they do live in water, but they'll leave the water almost every day to go and hunt for earthworms on the on the land next to the water. Oh. Um, they are fairly nondescript. The the annulation and the segmentation is pretty um pretty uh non-distinct. They they look quite smooth and people will find them when they're digging allotments or digging their garden. Uh and often they get put down as just being an odd looking um earthworm, but in fact they are leeches. The the giveaway is the is the sucker at the rear end. The front end the sucker's pretty um uh it's not very obvious. Um, and the eye pattern as well. You can see the eye pattern on these if you look carefully enough. They're they're quite as a as an earthworm, they'll be quite odd because they're quite flat at the the rear end. They've kind of got a, a paddle like um, shape at the back end, and particularly Trochita subviridis. Um, but yeah, we don't get many records of these. We don't see many records of these. But actually, when you start going back and looking through um, some of the records for uh, Arpobdella octoculata, you sometimes find these turning up, or horse leeches, I think, because they're roughly about the same size as horse leeches. And um, these can grow up to um, 20 centimetres, so they can be huge, huge leeches. Trochita pseudodina is slightly smaller, um, and uh, again, it's, the, the annulation and the segmentation is not that obvious. Um, it's, it's paler in colour than. Um, than uh, pseudo uh, than subviridus, but this is a preserved specimen, so it uh, it probably doesn't show the, the colour off as well as it could. And the final um, Arpobdella Arpobdella species is Dina lineata. This is a really delicate um, leech. It's, it's fairly small. It, it maybe only gets up to about a centimetre in length. Um, it's got this translucent sort of pinkish colour. In life, um, really, really nice looking leech. It, um, if you, if you see it in a tree, some leeches will just sort of like sit and and not move about much once you take them out of the water. But this one will just keep going round and round the tree. It, it, it never seems to stop. It's got the classic Arpobdella um, eye patterning, um, but it it really is not recorded much at all. It's probably more common in the north of Scotland. Um, than anywhere else. It seems to be one of the first leeches to have colonised um, after the Ice Age and has made its way all the way to the, the far north of Scotland, where a few others are on their way still. Um, but yeah, in some highland locks, you'll find this um, uh, exclusively. Um, we've got the two Piscicolidae. So we've got Piscicola geometra, which is, um, for long enough, was the only one we had in the UK. and. Uh, or was the one that everybody identified as in the UK. Um, we've talked about the eye patterning already. The rear sucker is particularly big um, for attaching to a fish when it's moving around. Um, you can just about see on the bottom right uh, blow up there the tiny black dots, which are the which are the ocelli that are on the the sucker, so it can sense light with these um, dots. The number of those ocelli um, helps separate it from the other species of Sidali, um, together with some of the patterning. 
And finally, Sedali, um, which is a relative newcomer. Um, it was only found um, in the UK, new to science from the UK uh, the in the last 10 years. Um, it is, both of these species are found in, in rivers um, and Geometra is found a lot in uh, canals and in lakes as well. Um, the the size and the width of the body and the, the size of the sucker are important key uh, key points for identification, together with the patterning on the body as well. The last two species are the medicinal leech on the top, Harudo medicinalis, and on the bottom, um, Haemopus sanguisuga, which is the uh, horse leech. They both have the same eye patterns, which is round the side of the uh, the body, um, ten, 10 eyes uh, positioned right the way along the, the edge of the, the head. Um, you can see the difference in the, the patterning here. The medicinal leech at the top is far brighter and, and more colourful than the horse leech on the bottom, which has a, generally has a, a dark black um, surface to the, the dorsal surface. Um, the only caveat to that is that in Scotland, um, the medicinal leeches are far darker and they don't have as much coloration. You will they, they, they almost look like you've you've taken a picture with black and white. Um, so the, the lines that you can see there in the dots on the dorsal surface are actually in darker gray sort of color on a black background. Um, really quite unusual. We're not really sure why what the difference is or why the difference is, but we're hopefully going to be looking at that um, soon to see if we if there's a genetic difference between the ones found in the south of England and the ones in the north of Scotland. Um, the, there are variations to these, so you can get horse leeches which have a, a checkerboard sort of a, a appearance, um, which are quite unusual, really quite rare. It seems to be some sort of um, recessive allele in the populations that uh, you know some populations will have this this expressed more than others. Um, the there's also a a very closely related um, species to the medicinal leech, verbana, uh, Herudo verbana, which has different patterning, um, and we we'll, we're on our keeping our eye out for that one in the UK and uh, in case it appears here. So that's a really quick blast through all the leeches in the UK. Um, so we've got 17 species. We um, there's I'll come on to the identification um, guides that we can use to identify them. It's a relatively small group, so it is actually doable. It's something that people come across very often. Um, so we'll see, we can see how uh, that goes on from there. Um, what I'd like to do for the rest of the talk is to um, Talk a bit more about the medicinal leech as, as perhaps the leech with the 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 most gruesome reputation. Although, I when we talk about gruesome gruesome reputations, I think all leeches get branded with the same thing. Um, this is a poster from a horror movie about the giant leeches which are going to take over mankind and rising from the depths of hell to kill and conquer. It says. Um, and on the right-hand side are some of the largest leeches in the world, the buffalo, le buffalo leeches, which are apparently quite good pets. Um, I'm not sure I'm quite up for, for that yet. But, um, but the medicinal leech um, has a long cultural history. Um, we have been using, the, the, there are records of, of the leeches being used in medicine from ancient Greece um, right through to the present day. The, they were widely used in medicine during the 18th and 19th century. Um, they were there was a, a Dr. Bruce in in Paris who advocated for the use of leeches in their hospitals, and they use, they were used for bloodletting to balance the humors. The, the humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and flame. And there was a a, a misconception, I guess that. Uh, that there was too much if there was too much blood in the body you weren't balanced so they would uh, bleed bleed patients to put them back into balance and this drove 
a huge demand for leeches across Europe. Um, every, all the hospitals wanted to use uh, leeches on their patients. They were prescribed by doctors. Um, there would be a medicine available at at uh, at chemists, and they're still used by the NHS today. Um, although it's not the native medicinal leech that's used, it's this uh, other one, Harudo verbana, which is used to encourage blood flow in skin grafts and, and to um, relieve blood clots and things uh, like that in particular circumstances. And to cater for that demand, there's, a, there's actually a leech farm in South Wales which breeds um, Harudo verbana for the, um, for the medical um, trade. But back in the 19th century, um, it, it was a huge trade. There was a, there were there were leech um, traders in almost all the country, all the major towns of the UK. These are just some adverts from from post office directories and the like, where uh, we see the adverts for Swedish leeches and and Hungarian leeches and so on. And there's particularly a receipt there for for uh, 57 choice leeches. Um, so there was a huge, huge market for these. Uh, there were 60 tonnes of leeches exported from Hungary every year to to serve the, the European demand. Um, Paris hospitals went through over 5 million leeches a year. The um, 7 million leeches were imported into London's hospitals in 1863 alone. Um, some of the records for, for France, for instance, um, so these, the, this is a study that was that looked at the um, the number of leeches you, uh, imported and exported from France. And you can see that on the in the dark, the, the solid line, you see that it peaks at fifty million a year being imported into France from other parts of of Europe. Um, by the by the middle of the nineteenth uh, century, they were actually exporting many of those that were coming in, and they were actually harvesting them in their own in 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 their own country they set up a large several large leech farms and then they were able to export them to other countries and that happened in the UK as well um so there was uh medicinal, medicinal leech used to be quite widespread and um, but it was harvested extensively harvested um in the UK and that was uh that was Predominantly done by um, women who were employed to walk bare legged into into water bodies, and the the leeches would then attach to them, bite them, and start feeding. And they would take them off and put them into a into a container. This is a a sketch from a a, a, a writer. I've, I've forgotten his name, um, but he he did this this um, engraving. Which showed the the process. Um, they were typically women who were um, shipped down from Scotland to do this in, into the north of England and in Yorkshire. Um, and there's some accounts of them becoming anemic because of the number of bites they were taking. When a when a leech bites you, uh, it can if it if it's taken a full bleed, it's it it will. Um, it, it's got a combination of an anaesthetic in its in its saliva with an anticoagulant, um, and that means that you you really feel it, it actually biting you, but the anticoagulant will act for quite some time, and and there are reports that you can bleed for um, up to ten hours after having a a leech bite. So these women would be horribly anemic um, doing this work, and. Interestingly, that William Wordsworth um, wrote a poem called Resolution and Independence, where he talked about meeting a, a leech gatherer. This time it was a, an old gentleman, um, but this was in 1802. And he talked, to, he, he talks in there about the, this leech gatherer saying that the, you know, he's seen a, a slow decay in the, the number of, uh, of leeches and he, he just happens upon them now he doesn't he doesn't you know the the old places aren't as good so they were already in decline in the 1800s um and they were uh hammered again with with the medical interest the um some of some of the the, the sort of like history that's grown up around 
cultural history that's grown up around uh, leeches uh, include this is a leech house. So this is the, the only surviving leech house, which is in Beedale, um, which uh, was where they would take the leeches to keep them keep them cool um, uh, while they were waiting to be shipped off elsewhere. And as I said, there's also, uh, these were on sale in chemists all over the country, um, often in quite elaborate jars uh, on the counter. So these are, these are leech jars. And when you consider how many uh, chem chemists must have had these leech jars and how few there are now in existence, you know, these these will often um, uh, make four figures in auctions. Um, when when they come up for sale, there's just they're just not, you know, they've just been tossed after after the leech craze, um, went went down. And um, something that some people may not realise is that uh, the the link between leeches and barbers. So le leeches were were used by barber surgeons, um, in the nineteenth century, and uh, there's uh, perhaps, uh fanciful story that the um, barber's pole is actually um, came about because of the leeches and it signifies the uh, bloody bandages that the barbers would have put on their on their patients on their on their customers after they'd had leeches applied and when they uh, washed them and put them out they would wrap around the pole that they were they were hung from and it created this uh, red and white banding on the pole whether that's true or not um is is debatable but uh, i like to think it every time i see it i think of leeches and then there was also some other weird uh, uses of leeches this is uh uh what was called the tempest prog prognosticator um which was a weather telling device it was designed in the early 1900s that used leeches and it's known that leeches will change their behaviour um, dependent on barometric pressure. And what this this device did was in each of the little jars at the bottom of the the machine um, was a leech. And when the leech clambered up the, the jar and got to the top, it, it touched a piece of whalebone that was attached to a, a wire. And that would ring a bell at the top of the, the machine. And if three bells rang at the same time, it suggested that the, there was a storm coming and they, they basically they, they thought that they could predict the weather with with the leeches. There's some truth in that, in that they will change their behaviour when there's a change in barometric pressure, but um, I can't, I, I'd rather have a barometer on my desk than uh, um, perhaps uh, one of these things. So we've, we've talked about uh, their use in medicine and historical collecting, but how do we go about looking for leeches just now? Well, for the for, for the majority of species, um, you're looking underneath stones on submerged material and typical techniques that you use for tick sampling um, other invertebrates in, in rivers or pond dipping um, can be used just sweeping a net through vegetation and the like. But for medicinal leeches, it's um, there's a very particular technique that we can use. Um, we mimic what those Scottish women were doing in Yorkshire um, back in the early 1800s, and we go into uh, a water body and we splash about pretending to be uh, some sort of livestock that's going down to drink um, so that the, the leeches will, will be attracted to it. And here is my colleague Sally um, demonstrating splash sampling. You stand in the shallows, you splash a net in the water, and you wait and see what comes towards you. And if you're lucky, you'll get a medicinal leech flowing towards you to uh, a way you can then sweep it up in the net. I should say that medicinal leeches are fully protected on the Wildlife Cutting Side Act, so you do need a license to, to do this work. Um, and Sally here is working as an agent on my license um, on a, in a site in the Scottish Highlands. The uh, uh, but people do go into rivers, um, uh, go into these sort of places for recreational purposes. So if you're in a in a uh, if you're fishing in a, a lake or you're, you're canoeing or or wild swimming or whatever, and you get leeches attached to you, 
please do take a photo, then carefully release it and put it back into the water. Um, and we'll be able to find, we'll be able to follow up and see if it was a, a freshwater a medicinal leach, sorry. Um, so this work that we're doing here surveying is part of a project called Species on the Edge. Uh, it's a project that's operating in Scotland, um, all across Scotland, that aims to take action on 37 declining and threatened species um, all around the coasts and islands of, of Scotland. It's led by Nature Scott and has um, a whole bunch of partners, including uh, bug life, amphibian, reptile conservation, bat conservation, um, bumblebee conservation, butterfly conservation, plant life, and the RSPB Scotland. Um, it's funded by the Natural Heritage Lottery Fund and other um, fund, uh, a, a few other funders. And basically, what we're doing is that we're we're looking at these species and looking how that we can help them. And one of the species is the medicinal leech. And it it kind of when we were developing this project, we I was aware that the back in the 1990s, Peter Maitland had done a lot of work on medicinal leeches and uh, looked at all the populations that were extant. There's only two extant populations in Scotland. Um, looked at all the extinct populations and see you know where they were and what had happened to them. And one of his recommendations was to that we should consider conservation breeding of, of medicinal leeches to release them into new sites and, and to reintroduce them into um, sites where they've been lost from. And this report was made in 1996. The suggestion was made in 1996 and nothing happened. Um, it's effectively sat on the shelf until Species on the Edge came along and we had the opportunity to actually take Peter's uh, recommendation and make it reality. And we're working with the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland on this part of the project, um, where we are surveying potential sites for, for leeches and the existing sites we know of. We are uh, taking some specimens into, taking some individuals into, um, into conservation breeding setup, and then we'll be translocating them back out into the wild. So I'm going to finish off with just some uh, photos of the of the conservation breeding um, setup that we have at Highland Wildlife Park with RZSS. So each of the leeches that we have, we've got 14 leeches, um, and each of them is housed separately at the moment in uh, in an aquaria. The aquaria has lots of stones and with bits of slate and stuff in it to to give them places to uh, hide under and potentially to lay their, their cocoons in eventually. And um, we're keeping them separate at the moment because we want to control when we we get uh, baby leeches. Um, this is one of the aquaria here. You can see it's got a fairly um, simple setup uh, with with water partially way, the way down and then um, uh, a, a cover on the top so the leeches can't get out, hopefully. Uh, this is Adam, who is the keeper at the, uh, at the Highland Wildlife Park that's looking after the leeches. And this is him preparing uh, leech lunch. Um, which is uh, basically just some some blood from the deer stock at the Highland Wildlife Park, which is then um, liquidized to uh, to regenerate the, to to reform the cells. Um, it's then heated. Um, so it's put, sorry, it's put into a into a sausage skin, um, which you can see Adam doing here. It's then heated up to make it. Um, more more like body temperature, and then it's put into the tank uh, for the leeches to feed upon. And the final image I've got here is a little time lapse over about I think it's about um, thirty minutes of a leech feeding on the on this blood meal. When you start this going, you'll see that it how much the the body expands as it feeds on this, and it'll feed on that, and then it'll potentially it won't feed again. For some time, it'll it'll just use those reserves to uh, to um, keep keep itself going. There it goes again. Um, we have observed uh, some uh, mating behaviour. So Adam captured this this um, this image, and he has some video as well of two mate two leeches before we separated them and um, two. Two leeches together, and it looks like they're 
the um, meeting there. That was in the autumn of last year. Uh, there's there's some evidence in the literature that they they will mate and hold on to that sperm for up to nine months before actually producing a cocoon. So that's all going swimmingly. Um, so hopefully we'll get some cocoons uh, in the early summer, and then we should have some uh, juveniles in the uh, later in the summer. Um, would really like you to be recording leeches. Uh, it's it, they they are under record, as Kieran said at the very start. Uh, a lot of people think they're difficult to do, but as I hope I've shown you, there's there's only seventeen. They're relatively easy to do, even to family. Um, would be a, a great start. We, uh, Rachel Davies and I run the recording scheme and we prefer to have records through iRecord because it, it makes it easier to handle the records, but it also allows people to see images of, of verified records um, on there. So like this record of Glossophonia complanata, you know, you can go back and have a look at that picture and compare it with your own specimen. So please do send in your records. We'll try and get through the verification as, as quickly as possible. If you want to know more about leeches, there are two publications um, that you can use. The, the FBA, the Freshwater Biological Association, has a, a taxonomic key to freshwater water leeches of Britain and Ireland, which includes a lot of information about their, uh, their life history and ecology. It also includes keys to the leeches themselves and to the, uh, and a, a sort of key to the cocoons as well, which is useful and um, well worth getting hold of. And if you're not wanting to go that far, but you want to try and do some uh, field ID of leeches, then Rachel and I are producing a, a guide to the leeches of Britain and Ireland um, with the FSC, the Field Studies Council. That is with them at the moment, and um, so we hope it will be out sometime later this year. That will be a picture guide um, with some ID tips uh, around the eye, eye um, patterning and stuff like that. Um, thanks to everybody that's helped with this work, um, particularly thanks to the funders of Species on the Edge, which allow us to do our, our um, conservation work on medicinal leech in Scotland. Um, thanks to Rachel, who helps me with the, the leech recording scheme. And then thanks to, to Kieran for the opportunity to actually present here. Any questions?